The routine we used to have at Chequers, the official country residence of the Prime Minister, was extraordinary. Churchill went there every weekend, and he would then send for the Chiefs of Staff or other people. About half past five or six <coughs> would come the message, the Prime Minister wants you to come to Chequers for the night. I had a board with six bell pushes on it. I used to turn it over, press on it, and bells rang on every floor in my headquarters. People used to run up and down saying, checkers, checkers, checkers. And everybody came with all the files and papers, dealing with every operation, every plan we had on hand. I filled a large suitcase with these and went down to checkers, not knowing what he wanted to talk about, but wishing to have all my facts with me. One used to drive down in the blackout <coughs> and arrive at checkers at about eight o'clock to join the party, which might include other chiefs of staff or ministers or visitors, and Lady Churchill and one of his daughters. At 8.30 p.m. the company is simple for drinks, and then at about 9 we went into dinner, and a very good dinner it used to be. It went on for a long while, <clears throat> and then at about 10.15 the ladies left the room, and Winston held forth over brandy and a good cigar. It was most entertaining and amusing. At about 10.40 or so we'd get up and join the ladies. We all went up and saw a film. He had a cinema projector at Checkers, and always had a film over the weekends. When the film was over, <coughs> which would be perhaps about 12.30 a.m., we had a nightcap with the ladies, and at about one o'clock in the morning, we'd start work, going through all the things we wanted to discuss, until 2, 3, or 3.30 a.m. On one occasion, General Marshall, the chief of the United States Army, was in the party. We went through this process, and at 12.30, when the ladies went to bed, he got up to go. We all said, you can't go now, it hasn't started yet. But Churchill was beaten at this game once, the only time I have ever seen him defeated. <coughs> General Smuts, his great South African friend, was among the party. And at about one o'clock, Winston said, well, now we will start work. No, said Smuts, I am not going to start work. I am not going to be a party to your murdering the British Chiefs of Staff. Here they are. They have to be back in the office by nine o'clock in the morning ready for me meetings at 9.30. You will still be lying in bed with a fat cigar dictating to your secretary. They have to work all the morning and all the afternoon, and in the afternoon you have a siesta. You bring them down here and make them work all night as well, you will kill them, and I'm not going to be a party to that. He then got up and went to bed. There was absolute silence for a minute or two. Nobody spoke. <coughs> Suddenly, Winston got up and said, well, perhaps we'd better go to bed. It was the only time we were let off. In retrospect, it's really rather extraordinary to think we were such good friends. After all, there's more than a quarter of a century apart in ages, and yet one never felt that in talking to him. One felt one was talking to somebody who was once equal in age, and was boss politically, but a man who was prepared to listen to what one had to say, uh, and it was great fun being with him. This friendship lasted a very long while. I think that I was one of the last people to go and have luncheon with him before he died. There was only one period of absolute estrangement. When I came back from India in 1948, he disapproved very much of the part I had played in giving independence to India. In fact, he didn't speak to me for about five years. The first time he spoke to me again was a moving occasion for me because he had made my father first see it all in 1912 and now he offered me the job of first see it all in 1955.